So hello, everybody. My name is Carol Ann Kettleson, and I'm a career consultant with the Career Service Office. I want to thank all of you for attending today. We're really excited about this, and we have a great partnership with UDM. And I'm excited to have them share with you all about their law school and their process. Just want to tell you a tiny bit about Career Services, put in a shameless plug for us. If you've never met with Career Services, I strongly urge you to come visit us. We work with all of the schools in the college, and you have a specific career consultant. So I'm with the College of Arts and Science, but if you are a different school, you would have a specific consultant. We work with you all the way through, helping you get job experience. So if you're thinking about law school, thinking early on, what types of things can you do early on, job shadowing, internships, working in a law firm, those type of things. We can help you with your resume. We can help you um, obtain those various positions. We work with you all the way through Oakland. And once you graduate from Oakland, we continue to work with you. This session, as well as all of our virtual workshops, are Handshake. And you all have Handshake accounts. And there are libraries in there under the resource section that give you examples of resumes and interviewing and those type of things. So I don't want to take a lot of time talking about career services. So I'm going to turn it over to Barbara, who's going to introduce our speakers and tell you more about the format of the session. So thank you again for attending today. Hi, it was great to meet um, a handful of you as we began earlier today. My name is Barbara Stockwell Buslip. Um, I'm an admission specialist at Detroit Mercy Law. I've been here at the university for uh, almost 16 years. Um, I do not have a law degree, but I do have a master's in counseling and I'm a licensed counselor. Um, I am the representative that can help you through the admissions process from Oakland. If you're interested in a tour, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'd love to show you campus. Um, we are doing individual tours now, um, prearranged, so that's available. I do want to introduce Professor Archer. Um, she's going to be our guest speaker today. She will be chatting um, if you've had a chance to read her case. After that, we will have, uh, I have a, um, a panel of some of Oakland graduates uh, or students who've, who've attended Oakland and um, some not um, to share their law school experience. And then I'm available for the last half, half an hour where I will be able to share um, the admissions process, um, what you need for law school. I spoke to one student today earlier who was a freshman, what the next step is to seniors, to Chad, who's gonna be graduating and going on. So um, let me introduce Professor Archer. Professor Archer has her JD from um, Harvard Law School and her BA from Stanford. Her research and teaching interests include commercial law, education law, alternative dispute resolution, Latino law and policy. So with that, I introduce Professor Archer and I'll let her put together her format and how she wants to best um, reach you all because I do think she said she's doing some cold calling if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I did say that. Um, so hi everyone, I am Erin Archard. As, as Barbara explained, I teach a number of subjects. Um, my primary areas of research are in education law and dispute resolution, which is things like negotiation, mediation, arbitration. I only have half an hour with you, which is about a third of the length of an actual one of my classes. Um, and so typically in a class, I would use some PowerPoints. I would do a little bit of lecture. I might do a little bit of that with you all here today, um, but I'm not actually going to use PowerPoints at all. Um, I just have my case that I sent to you all, uh, Leonard v. PepsiCo up in front of me. And so one of the things that we do in law school to give you a sense of what a 1L law school class is like is something called the Socratic method. Uh, you may have professors at um, Oakland University who are doing that with you too. And what the Socratic method means is the professor spends a lot of time asking questions of the students to try to draw out pieces of the reading. Um, I think somebody was mentioning uh, when we were chatting before class that they're not used to reading this kind of thing. And that that is true, right? So uh, reading a legal opinion, even a relatively contemporary one, which this is, this is just from you know, the end of the last century, 1999, um, even that it's going to take you a lot longer to read you know, four or five pages of this than it's going to take you to read 
probably most of your sort of undergraduate textbooks. And so I think for most law students, a common experience as you start one L is like, I have you, first you're like, oh, I only have 20 pages of reading. And then you go, oh, I have 20 pages of reading. This is going to take me hours. And that's that's right. That's accurate experience, at least for most one else. Um, so if this took you a long time to read, I, uh, I don't apologize, but I understand, right? Because that's how, that's how it works. Um, if you all could help me out by going to your names in the participants list, and this, this, you know, this isn't graded, right? This is just for, I don't know, public glory. Um, if you could indicate with a yes next to your name, whether or not you have done the reading. So you go to you go to your participant list, you go to rename, and you just put something like yes next to your, your name. Um, so I can see. And then I'm just gonna call you uh, periodically as I talk. Uh, so that's that's basically how law school class works. Professor's gonna be talking and then all of a sudden they're gonna say, um, you know, Mr. Herpich, or they'll say John, uh, and then, or John H, or however, I tend to call by first names, I'm a Californian, right, so, you know, there you go, but a lot of professors are more formal, um, and they'll say something like, you know, so, so John H, um, what was the uh, alleged contracted issue in our Leonard B. PepsiCo case? What was it a contract for? Um, so it was basically the uh, plaintiff, I guess, was uh, essentially saying that the Pepsi uh, commercial was offering them a, a fighter jet, a Harrier jet, I think, for uh, a certain amount of Pepsi points that you could accrue. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're dealing with in this case that you are reading is an alleged contract for a Harrier jet. Um, so to give you all a, a sort of sense of what contracts big picture looks like as a course, you spend roughly the first half of the course talking about how to form a contract. What does it mean to even be a contract? Um, how are they formed? What are the sort of elements that you need to have what we would consider a legally enforceable contract here in the United States? That's sort of the first half of the course. That's what this opinion is dealing with, right? The question is, is not how do we interpret this contract, which is the second half of the course. The second half of the course is like, hey, we agreed to do a bunch of things. And uh, what usually happens, right, is that we enter into contracts with the best of intentions. We fully intend to perform everything exactly uh, as as everybody agreed upon. And then as you start performing under a contract, you realize, you know, maybe circumstances have changed and we can't perform the way we anticipated. Or maybe the drafting wasn't quite as clear as we thought at the time when we signed the contract. And now there's a disagreement about what the parties have actually agreed to do. That's sort of the second half of the course. And then, you know, the end of the course, we talk about what kind of remedies do you get? Um, so one specific remedy that you can get in contracts is something called specific performance. All right. Um, so that's distinguished from monetary damages. And in contract, we actually usually prefer money, right? The, the preference in a court, a judge who's ordering, you know, you breached a contract you have to pay up, usually that just means you have to give money, right? But in this case that we're reading, right, what John Leonard is asking for, and John Leonard, by the way, was a very enterprising business school student uh, out, of, out of Seattle, Washington, right? He saw the added issue here today and you know, he didn't have $700,000 lying around his house. I don't know if that was clear from the case. He went and got investors, right? He, he organized an investor pool to get him the money so that he could, you know, put the money down to buy this jet under the rules that he saw connected with this Pepsi stuff campaign. All right, but what does, what does Mr. Leonard 
want. And so I see a, let's see, Emma Ross. I see that you have read the case. What, what kind of remedy does John Leonard want here? What is he He's asking? essentially asking that Pepsi honor the agreement that they are the perceived offer that he thought they were giving in their commercial. And he wants the jet that he thought was being advertised. Yeah, he doesn't want money. He wants the jet. Presumably so he can resell it, but I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty sure the U.S. military, as uh, Judge Wood points out at some point in this case, the U.S. military probably is not going to actually let him fly this thing around, but he wants specific performance. He wants the Pe Pepsi Co. to give him the jet. Right. Um, and what's interesting is that you know, PepsiCo is actually the one that ends up sort of in initiating these proceedings because they want the court to say one way or another, yes, Pepsi, you have to give him the jet or you have to honor the contract in some way. Right? Again, could be monetary damages. Um, or right, they want PepsiCo wants the court to say, no, you don't actually that there isn't anything here. There's no contract claim. So you don't have to perform at all, right? Because there's no contract. All right. Um, and so let's jump back to these elements of a contract. What makes something here in the United States a legally enforceable contract? Well, one of the things that you need is what's called an offer. Right. And an offer is just some sort of promise. It's, you know, a promise typically framed along the lines of if you do something for me, I will do something for you. Um, and then you need an acceptance of that offer. I agree. And you also, as part of that, need an element of exchange. This is what... Um, in, in the doctrinal lingo, we call something consideration, right? If you go to law school, you will spend several weeks of your life reading cases about the intricate nuances of consideration for a contract. But short version is that in most contracts here in the United States, consideration is money. Right. Consideration is you agree to do a thing in exchange for money, right? Maybe it's you agree to sell me your iPhone. Maybe it's you agree to come and rake all the leaves out of my backyard right? in exchange for money. And those kinds of contracts where we sort of both agree um, are person making the offer and the person accepting the offer, we both sort of agree, we're going to do this. I promise that if you do the thing I'm asking you, I promise if you go and rake my leaves, I will pay you 50 bucks. You say, great, I agree. I'm showing up on Sunday. And that is what we refer to in contracts as a bilateral contract, meaning both sides have made promises to each other that they're going to carry out going forward. Right, so performances, raking the leaves, paying for raking the leaves, right? And it's bilateral because you have two people that are agreeing to do stuff in the future. All right. So, of course, that's the easy stuff. That's not, that's not the stuff that you read in law school because in law school, you read the hard stuff. Um, so Leonard v. PepsiCo is kind of a hard case because there's sort of this question about whether it even meets this kind of traditional setup or whether it's something that is sometimes called a unilateral contract, meaning a situation where um, the way that you accept is not promising to do an action in the future, but just doing the action. And so there's this whole line of um, case law, much of which you see referenced in this case about, you know, when can what is sometimes called an offer of reward or what you might think of as like an ad that has some sort of award attached to it or reward attached to it, 
when can that actually be an offer for a unilateral contract? When can that be an offer that the person hearing it just performs the action required? Now they've accepted the offer. Right. And the reason that's called unilateral is because there's nothing in the future that that person who's accepting the offer is doing. They've done their performance. Only one person, only one party is left to perform. And what is that performance typically? Payment. Right. Um, so I could do the rake the leaves scenario and I could just say, if you show up and rake my leaves, I will give you 50 bucks. That's an offer, right? And there's two ways you can accept that. You could say, yep, I agree. I am going to be the one to come and rake your leaves. I will do it on Sunday. We shake, bilateral contract. You have yet to perform, I have yet to perform. Two performances in the future. Or you could just show up, right? In my offer, I don't say when you have to come, I don't say when you have to do it. So my offer is pretty open-ended. You could just show up, write the leaves, ring my doorbell and be like, hey, Professor Archer, look at your backyard. Got all those chestnut leaves out. And I would say, great, here's 50 bucks. Okay. We're done, right? You accept my offer by doing the performance. I'm the only one left with an obligation and that's to pay you for doing the work. All right. So slightly different way, right, of forming a contract, but also a valid way of forming a contract. So it turns out that um, we live in a sort of capitalist society and people are always putting out ads, right? You see ads all the time for lots of different things. And the default rule about ads is what? So let's go to Juliana Jones. Most of the time, Juliana, are the ads that you see offers in this contractual sense? No, they are not normally considered contractual offers. That's right. That's right. So the default is that ads are not offers. And we see that, you know, stated pretty clearly in Leonard v. PepsiCo. And they talk about some of the famous cases, one of which I think is very timely, but also I worry is like a little triggering when I teach it. It's the Carlisle v. Carbolic Smoke Ball. This is one of these ye old English cases where a manufacturer of a medical device, which was a rubber ball full of carbolic acid, Right, that you would shoot up your nose, which presumably then irritated all of your sinuses and caused them to drain. It's sort of like, sort of like a neti pot, but more dangerous, right? Um, they put out an ad that anybody who used this product and caught influenza was entitled to a hundred pounds. Um, Mrs. Carlisle used the product, caught influenza, tried to collect her 100 pounds, had to sue to get it. And the court said, look, you know, most of the time, ads are not offers. They're what are called solicitations to deal. They are not offers. They are, in fact, like ways to attract buyers to come to the store and make an offer. But sometimes an ad is specific enough that the person hearing the ad could construe it as an offer, could think, oh, okay, if I do these things as listed in the ad, you know, it's clear, it's definite, the performance that is required is very specific, right? Then sometimes a court will say, yeah, that's actually an offer. So I'm gonna kick us, if I can get this to work, I want you to look at the ad that John Leonard saw. Introducing the new Pepsi Stuff Catalog. Now, the more Pepsi you drink, the more great stuff you're going to get. Sure beats the bus. <laughs> Uh, 
All right, so that, that was what John Leonard saw on the TV. They were running it in this sort of Seattle test market. And he goes, gets a copy of the Pepsi catalog, says, oh, wait, the rules in this say I only need 15 actual Pepsi points, and then I can just do the rest uh, via check. That's when he goes out and gets the investors. Um, so at that point in time, then, um, I'm going to go with um, Miriam Salim. What is Pepsi's defense? What, do, what does Pepsi say to try to convince the court? We didn't actually, this isn't one of those ads that is an offer. So Miriam um, Salim. Yeah, I, Pepsi's defense is that no reasonable person like in their right state of mind would consider this an offer and it's just supposed to be a humorous joke. It wasn't clear, definite, or binding for somebody to accept such an offer of a Harriet Jet. It just seems so absurd and not even reachable. Right. And and Judge Wood clearly buys this argument because Judge Wood goes into sort of great detail about like, hey, hey everyone, let me explain to you why this is absurd. Um, but that's that's the defense, right? The defense is um, there wasn't an offer here because we were clearly joking. And so there is a whole line of cases uh, that you will read when you go to law school about this idea of, is it a joke or not? Because part of the difficulty is when we're talking about these notions of, is there an offer? Has the person who heard it accepted the offer? These offer and acceptance doctrine. Um, a lot of times we get into these conversations about subjective understanding versus objective understanding. Because of course, what is John Leonard gonna say? Right? I, John Leonard, looked at this ad. And it said you'd give me a Harrier jet. It said you'd give me sunglasses and um, a cool leather jacket and a Pepsi t-shirt and a Harrier jet. And seeing that, I believed subjectively in my mind, I'm, I'm willing to literally go to federal court on this, that we had, that that was an offer that I could accept. Right. But rather than relying on what John Leonard subjectively in his head believed, right? And I'll go back to you on this one, Miriam. What standard does the court use, right? Who does the court sort of care about what they believed? You there, Miriam? Yeah. Um I'm guessing they care more about what the substance of the contract, if there was a contract, and like if it was clear that um, uh, Leonard would get such an offer from them. So if it was clear, definite, or explicit, and it leaves like no room for negotiation, then oh, it would. I mean, it doesn't seem, I mean, it seems clear and definite enough to me, right? It's the person who shows up with seven, what was it, 700,000 Pepsi points gets the, the Harrier jet. Um, um, I, but, I, and, I, and John, John Leonard, you know, let's just put this out there. John Leonard's testifying in court. I saw that and I believed I could get a Harrier jet. Yeah. But does the um, court really care what he thinks? No, they don't really care what he thinks. I'm, I'm, they're more concerned if it was uh, written was if there was a written agreement between them and I think it was if it was more than five hundred dollars then it should be um a written contract for it to be an agreement between them I'm guessing. So so you you raise an interesting point. Um I thought I cut out most of the statute of fraud stuff, but maybe I left it in because I like statute of frauds. I teach sales. Um <laughs> but you know there is there is a requirement that for a sale of goods 
that is worth more and goods are, you know, movable things, right? Um, your books, your keyboard, your bike, your car, a Harrier jet. Um, if it's more than $500 here in Michigan, a thousand, um, that it has to be in writing. That's called the statute of frauds. And as the name suggests, that's to prevent fraud. Um, but what I'm getting at is sort of the standard of review that the court is using in terms of what would have been believed by the person seeing this ad. And at the end of the day, and, and I'll probably sort of wrap up with this because you are going to hear this word so many times, at least if you take contracts with me and probably if you take contracts with anybody else, it comes down to a reasonableness standard. Right. So what does the court care about? Not what subjectively was in John Leonard's mind, but what an objective, reasonable person would have thought when they saw this commercial. Right. And the court very much believes that unlike some of these other cases where you see it and you, and you think, oh yeah, that's actually something that I can do, that I can perform and get, an objective, reasonable person viewing this ad wouldn't think it was an offer. They wouldn't think it was something that they had the power to accept. And so if there's no offer, no contract. Uh, questions? Anything you wanted to bring up from reading the case? All right, well, I will stick around uh, for a few minutes. I know we have students joining us. I'm also happy to talk um, I've been on our admissions committee many years at the law school, so I'm happy to talk about admissions as well. Thank you, Professor Archer. I see Christian here, and I know Emily's here. Emily, are you there? I saw you earlier. Yes, I'm here. Okay, sorry, Emily. I saw you earlier. Um, no. I just want to take a few seconds. Oh, and Brianna, are you there? I see Brianna. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep track of everybody. I apologize. Um, once again, I want to introduce some of our um, current law students um, at Detroit Mercy Law, um, a variety of different backgrounds. Um, I'd like um, each of the students, our current students, to share a little bit about themselves, um, their journey to law school, maybe something about their major, something about law school, things like that. Um, uh, Emily's done this before. I think Christian's done this before. I'm not sure, Brianna, you've done this before, but I'll start with I'll, I'll start then I'll, that look, I will go with Christian then um, and ask Christian to share. Christian is coming to us from Windsor. So uh, uh, that's wonderful. Thanks, Christian. Uh, let me introduce Christian and Christian, why don't you share some information about yourself? So hi everyone, uh, my name is Christian Iresi. I'm a 3L student um, at Detroit Mercy Law. Uh, so I'm actually from Canada. Uh, I'm in the single JD program. Uh, so I went to school. Uh, my undergrad was in biology and biochemistry at the University of Windsor. Um, took a little detour uh, through my path to law school and I eventually settled on law school because uh, that's where I want to be. Um, the reason why I wanted to go to law school is because throughout my research in school, I realized I didn't love science that much and I actually really started to love reading, writing, and researching. And that's pretty much all you do in law school and then in the professions. So um, it seemed like a perfect fit. Um, a little bit about me, I, uh, I have an interest in health law. I'm working for a health law firm. Um, that's, uh, I'm sure you can learn a little bit more of that later. <laughs> um, and so some of the things I do at school is, uh, I am the, one of the two 3L class reps. Um, so I represent the students, uh, whenever there's issues with, um, basically anything that goes on with the school, I act as a liaison between, uh, the students and the staff and faculty. And we try to help everyone kind of communicate effectively. Um, I'm also the president of the run club. It's called the Tortious and the Hare. Um, Shout out to Professor Archer for helping with that name and uh, some of the Latin we use in our slogan. But um, yeah, so uh, basically, yeah, I'm uh, involved in a few things. And oh, who do we lose there? Oh, Barbara lost her. OK. Oh, oh I, um, you know, I'm in the faculty lounge. So when I don't move, <laughs> lights go off. The lights go off. Got to stay so, active. Um, but yeah, so that's good. that's a little bit about me. Um, if you have any questions about anything, I'm always open. Um, I'll put my email in the chat uh, so you guys can shoot me an email if you have any questions and uh, look forward to meeting some of you. Um, Christian, let's, let's, let's expand about, about your tortoise and hare running club. How did that come about? I only share this because law school is not just law. It's 
um, networking and people, and it's that whole picture that's really important. And I think this tortoise and hare, um, which I found out about, which ironically, believe it or not, I think it's a great way to do it. So Christian, do you mind sharing a little bit about that? Yeah, um, so basically I, I've always been a runner. I run quite a bit. Um, and after your first couple of weeks of 1L, uh, all your reading and all the cold calls and everything kind of start to add up a little bit and you start to get a little stressed. So I spoke to my new friends and I'm like, hey, do you guys want to go for like a little run to de-stress? And they said, sure. Uh, that started about five people. We went for a run in downtown Detroit. We kind of made like a little tour of the city. Uh, and then we ended at a bar to have some food and drinks. Um, the next week, a few people heard about it and they said like, hey, can we join? And then eventually after a couple of weeks, it, we had a solid group of, you know, 10 to 20 people that wanted to go out and it kind of became like a, uh, a nice wind down to the week. Every Friday after class, we'd go out for a run and got to just talk about everything we learned and just decompress a little bit. But that's Detroit Mercy is great for organizations. There is probably an organization for anything you can think of. And the nice thing about our student organizations and our board of governors is that they empower us to basically start any organization that we want. So um, if there isn't something you are interested in, you can definitely start that. And that's always a good thing to help make friends and network. Great, great. How about you, Emily? Can you share a little bit about your experience? Emily is um, one of our three plus three students um, who attended Oakland University. And Emily, are you a 2L this year, I'm correct? Yes, yeah, I'm a 2L. I feel like I've known you for a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know we don't spend much time, but yes, can you share some information about yourself? Yeah, so um, like Barbara said, I came from Oakland University. I did the three and three program. Um, I was focused on political science, but I ended up switching to integrative studies just because I was working full-time as a paralegal while I was doing my undergraduate degree and uh, integrative studies just made that more, it made it smoother. It was easier for me to get the courses I needed at night to be able to graduate on time in order to come to Detroit Mercy on time. So um, uh, like I said, I'm a 2L here at Mercy. We're getting to spend our first year on campus, which is exciting. Um, I'm the fundraising chair of the Black Law Student uh, Organization, which is really, really good. I love that. Um, it's great to be a part of. Um, I am currently an extern at the Office of Legal Counsel for Governor Whitmer. Um, I work on a lot of legislation there, so that's very interesting. Um, and this summer, I will be spending my summer at Warner Norcross here in Detroit. Great, great. Brianna, are you ready? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Brianna Hines. I am also a 2L like Emily. Um, in undergrad, I went to Western Michigan University and I had a major in political science and that kind of helped um, spark my interest in wanting to go to law school. Like Emily said, this is our first year in person, so I've been enjoying it so far. Um, at the law school last year, I was a 1L class representative through the S Student Bar Association, which is like our student government, like Christian touched on a little bit. This year, I am the treasurer of the Black Law Students Association. This past summer, I was an extern for the Honorable Mark Goldsmith at the United States Court of the Eastern District of Michigan, and I also worked at a law firm, the Miller Law Firm. And currently, I am working for the Neighborhood Defender Service of Detroit. I'm an intern there, and we do a lot of criminal defense work. So that has been a lot of fun so far. Good, good. Um, let me ask all of you, have any of you, and it might be just be Christian because he's, he's a 3L, any um, clinical experiences? It sounds like you've done a lot of experience working within law firms and, and volunteer and things like that. Has anybody done any clinical experiences? I think it might be Christian, you might be the only one, or you're going to be doing it. You're going to be doing <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't done my clinic yet. Actually, I was saving it to be in person, hopefully. So, I mean, I'm not sure with COVID how that's going, but yeah, uh, next semester will be my clinic. Okay, well, a clinical experience um, at Detroit Mercy Law, just to share, is an opportunity for students to kind of test the waters to actually work with clients. Um, and we have anywhere from nine to 11. 11 different clinics that you can choose from, and it is uh, mandatory. So Emily and Brianna is just starting their second year. And like I said, Christian will be doing it probably, he has to do it by the time he graduates um, for, his, uh, for his second semester. So um, let me ask you another question. What do you think was the most challenging? And I know Christian, you were in person and online and now you're back in person. So you've kind of back and forth. And Emily and Brianna is, is now you, you were online and in person. What has been the most challenging part um, of, of the learning process for, for law school? Um, and, you know, with the pandemic and things like that, and, and how, how has the faculty and staff provided support for you in that area? I can talk to that. So are you saying specifically during COVID right now or just in general? Yeah, just in general, just about yeah. your law school experience. So I think one thing that I 
probably didn't do as much in my undergrad was study in groups or use like my peers to help study. Um, and especially actually office hours as well. Um, those are both things I really leaned on in my 1L year when we were in person. So the trouble was once we went online, it was very difficult to meet up with my friends to go to office hours initially um, throughout COVID. Um, so that was difficult for me. However, Professor, I know Professor Archer was very good about this. Even though I didn't have her, she was my advisor on Law Review. Um, we met, I think it was weekly or bi-weekly via, uh, via Zoom. Um, most professors at the school extended their office hours to be actually by appointment. And I think using Zoom and different technologies, we all adapted actually. I felt like I met with my professors more in, uh, during the pandemic because we had these extra times to uh, just jump on the computer and talk for about a half an hour. So I think that was the this challenge was at first not being with my peers or with, you know in person, but we adapted pretty quickly, I think. How about you, Emily? How's how the adaptation? Yeah, I, I would second what Christian said. I mean, just, you know, coming into your first year and not, because we, I never had any in-person classes because I'm a two also. My entire first year was completely online. So getting to know your classmates was a little bit harder. So um, a lot of it you were just doing by yourself. Um, but we, you know, our instructors made themselves very available so that was really helpful. Um, eventually we did make groups and, you know, we were able to study in groups, which is very helpful. And I recommend everybody does that if they can. Um, Balsa was another huge resource for me. We host study sessions. Um, we go over outlining techniques. So that really helped me because I didn't, I mean, I kind of outlined in undergrad, but not like you need to in law school. So the resources in Balsa were a huge help for me. Um, and then coming back in person, I think that just like that transition into going from, you know, all of our exams were open book, open note, and then coming back into person and their closed book, closed note. And so you have to kind of readjust how you're going to study, how you're going to prepare for the exams, what to expect on them. So I think that's kind of been an area where I've had to adjust my style, but I feel like that's not unique to me. That's like just universal across a pandemic. I mean, we're all having to constantly adapt to situations that are changed that is you know i mean the situation is very fluid we don't know you know are we is are the numbers going to skyrocket and we'll have to go back online we don't know so um yeah just that fluidity you know can be challenging when you're trying to plan how you're going to what type of exam you need to be prepared for mm-hmm. how about you brianna how did you how did you adjust to the online to in person and the support services that were available to you yeah, so like Emily and Christian both said, it well, starting law school in general was a huge adjustment compared to undergrad. In undergrad, I actually don't think I ever went to office hours because I didn't feel like there was a need. So then coming to law school and we're just being, we're just given a lot of information at once. Um, so then I realized, okay, office hours are something that I need to start going to and TA sessions. And then like Emily talked about outlining, I had never done that before. So that was an adjustment. Um, but even through the online learning last year, like Christian said, the professors really made themselves available, which was very nice. And so did our TAs. And um, eventually there was study groups, which was helpful. But also the Black Law Students Association was very helpful too, like Emily said, with outlining, learning how to IRAC, just learning how to take a law school exam in general, because I just didn't know what that was like. Um, but then moving into this year, I have loved the in-person atmosphere, but it has been different compared to online because, you know, you're seeing everyone every day and then getting used to or trying to prepare for the in-person exams is something I'm still trying to figure out how to best approach. But it has been a nice transition and the professors have still made themselves very available and flexible, which has been great throughout these past two years. Well, here and now. <laughs> Good. Um, you know, one person mentioned TA. Who can explain what the TA is? Emily, or Christian, or Brianna? Oh, I, I can. I, I am a TA, so I'm. You're a TA. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Professor Rosenbaum's TA, so that's property one. If you guys take it in person next year, you'll probably have me as your TA. Um, we are essentially assistants to the professor. We host sessions where, like, I build out flowcharts for all of the concepts that we go over, and I make them available to the students. And then I draft hypos based on the information that's in the flow chart. So any topic, like if it's capture and first possession, I'll write a capture and first possession hypo. And then I will give them the flow chart and I will give them the hypo too, like about 
a day or two before class so they have time to go over it and then we'll walk through it and i'll talk about techniques for how to draft your answer on an exam so that you are stating your rule statement and doing your analysis in such a way that you're tying the facts of your case to the case that you're pulling the rule from and making sure that you're sort of you know hitting all the points of the rule and then tying it all together in your conclusion so it's not just because i know like the first law school exam i took like it was a it was a hard landing like i did not know what i was doing or saying so i really with my students i really try to make sure that none of the topics that they go into an exam on they are going to go into blind they are going to have at least heard me talk through a scenario that's similar to what they're looking at and be you know have some sort of foundation or structure to explain the rule and tie their facts to the rule and tie their facts to the facts of the case that they're citing the rule from so that they can arrive at a you know reasonable well thought out conclusion because like i didn't always do that in my first exam so you know i, I try to be helpful with that so that's that's what tas do so I always say a TA, so the teacher teaches the class and the TA provides the support. It's like if somebody says, says something to you and you go, I don't understand what you're saying. And then somebody else says it and they go, oh, that makes sense. That's the TA. So the TA breaks it down. They don't teach the class, they provide support. So the cool thing is um, those are students who've done well in the class, enjoyed the class. Um, and that's available to you also. And students participate in that. I think Christian shaken his head that he's taken advantage of, of TAs and things like that. Have, have you done that, Christian? Yes. Uh, yes, I did. And I'm also, so actually I was, Emily, was I your TA last year? Yeah, you were my property two TA. Yes, that's what I thought. I thought okay, yeah. So I was your property TA. It sounds like you're doing great stuff with flowcharts. I did, um, I like to provide my, well, redacted versions of my own outline to show students, give a little preview of what they need to know. Um, for I'm currently the so legal writing uh, one for one of our legal writing classes. I'm a TA. It's a little different. That's all about writing. So what I do is um, I take a look at students' writing before they submit it, and I kind of give them pointers on how to kind of clean things up and uh, be a little uh, more succinct in their writing. Um, and the other thing I think that was important for me, at least uh, as a TA, was I was kind of the liaison between the students and the professors. So. You know, there's sometimes issues um, if the professor was moving too fast or maybe their teaching style wasn't uh, perfect <laughs> for every each and every student. I could hear their concerns and kind of bring it anonymously to the professor and maybe see if we can adapt the, uh, the teaching style to uh, suit everyone. So yeah, uh, TAs are invaluable. That's good. I um, would say ask, from a uh, professor's perspective, Barbara, oh. another thing that TAs do that's really helpful. And so I definitely encourage any of the students who are on the line, if you go to law school, go to your TA sessions, get to know the TA for your class. They're really good at um, sort of interpreting the professor's um, preferences for the students, because even though every professor will sort of make a nod towards this, uh, we, we use this term called IRAC uh, a lot, which is basically just what's the legal rule, doing analysis around the legal rule, developing a conclusion that Emily was talking about. But almost every professor is going to want you to lay that out a little bit differently. Um, and so your TAs are going to be really helpful at telling, you know, Professor Archard wants you to do this. Professor Rosenbaum wants you to do that. Um, and I think that's sort of a piece of the law school experience that a lot of people don't really catch on to early enough in 1L. Um, and that's one way that TAs can be really helpful is sort of helping you not only develop the basic skills, but then take it to the next level by really dialing in on what your particular professor wants. We call that, um, you know, their language, you know, you know, their needs, <laughs> because every teacher has this similar, same goal, same goal, but different ways to achieve that goal. Um, let me ask a question for the group. Um, has anybody take, participated in career services? One of our strengths is our career services and the types of support they provide to students and job opportunities and, and things like that. Um, Brianna, have you done anything? Have you done anything with career services? Can you share of your experience? Yes, so career services, I send them my resume. <laughs> <laughs> I send them my resume anytime I update it and they help me tweak it um, to make it more well, help my wording and just to make it the best it can be. So I do that. Um, they helped me get my job this coming summer through the um, OCI process, which is on-campus interviews. 
Um, so that was extremely helpful. I did a lot of practice interviews with them before the, that interviewing process start. That helped a lot because a, a legal law school interview is different than interviews that I have done before. And it helps me prepare for the types of questions that I may be asked. Um, and that, they also um, help with my cover letter too, which was extremely helpful as well. How about you, Christian? I know, see you're shaking your head. Yeah, they, that was the biggest help for me. So um, I'm sure many of you have written a cover letter before, um, and I'm sure many of you also struggle with bragging about your uh, yourself. Um, that was one thing the CSO helped me with. They helped me, uh, you know, they, they read my cover letter and they're like, Christian, you did this, you did that. They, you know, you started this run club. There, there's different things I didn't think of and I didn't feel comfortable writing, but they encouraged me to to write my cover letter, to write my resume in a way that would you know benefit me. I also got a job through the OCI process. Um, because of their help, uh, I had to do mine fully online, and so they helped not only uh, I mean, help me set up my computer setup. They told me what I should get, what kind of camera. They made recommendations, but they also uh, kind of eased my kind of nerves going through the whole process. With uh, I get Zoom interviews are very strange, and they they helped me with that um, by giving multiple practice interviews and just giving us the ease of uh, the peace of mind if there's any technical issues. Um, beyond that, they have also helped me. This might not apply to many of you, but with uh, any uh, questions about um, immigration and uh, my visas. They've helped me walk the process. Basically, anything you need to help get a job, they have been there for me. So, mm -hmm. how about you, Emily? How'd you get your job with uh, the governor's office? So that actually, I got that through a practice interview. Like Christian was saying, we have practice interviews that are set up, and I did several practice interviews going into my one L um, OCIs. And one of them was with someone who happened to work at the governor's office. And I, I thought when she told me what she did, I was like, oh, that's so cool. Can I stay in touch with you? Would you mind? And she was like, of course. And a few weeks later, she said, you know, we're looking for externs for the summer and for the fall. Would you like to apply? And I had already secured an externship at uh, or a summer associate position at Plunkett Cooney that summer. So I couldn't do it over the summer, but I said, yeah, for the fall. So I applied and I got it. And then when I was doing my OCIs, which are all through career services, um, Tanya is great, by the way, I love her. She's helped me so much with my resume and my interviewing and everything that, uh, everything we have to do for that. So um, yeah, I, like I said, I did OCIs and I got a job at Warner Norcross through that. And I'm really grateful for that. And like I said, they are great with, with helping you with your writing samples and everything. So yeah, definitely. That's good. We always talk about networking in law school and that's a great, a great analogy of how that worked. You never know who you're going to meet. Um, let me ask you one, oh, a couple one other, thing. oh, pardon me. Sorry, one thing they also do, career mm -hmm. services, they do lunch with the lawyer every so often. So that's a good way to network and then to talk with lawyers that are in different um, fields. One that I saw recently, they did a public defense and prosecutor one. So that was cool just to hear about what they do. Um, so it's not just one area of law that's focused on, you get a variety, which I appreciate from career services. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Brandon. So lunch with a lawyer is um, when it was, <clears throat> excuse me, when we were, <clears throat> excuse me, in person, we would have somebody come in that we would have, a, you would have a free lunch, you could join us, they would share about their experiences. Um, last year, we had it um, virtual on Zoom. Um, hopefully, they'll be resuming those again. But it's an opportunity to network because law is a very networking type of community. I'll, I'll just shoot this question out to Professor Archer without even prepping her. How did you, how did you get some of your first jobs? And, and what was your experience? So I know you went to um, Harvard and Stanford, different schools, but kind of share with yeah. us a little bit about your experience. Sure. Well, I mean, I think it's largely the same way. So my first summer after law school, I worked at a nonprofit and it was, you know, a nonprofit where one of the attorneys there, it was the Education Law Center in Philadelphia, and one of the attorneys there was a Harvard grad um, and had sort of made it. We had um, some, you know, a, a sort of equivalent of the Office of Career Services. And so they had the, all these postings for people who knew they wanted to do nonprofit work. Um, and actually that same summer, I remember I wanted to do something in education law. And so I had, I called and spoke with another alum who was at the Department of Education. And they were like, mm, after talking to me for about 15 minutes, um, this was, this was um, you know, during a prior presidential administration, obviously. And they, ju they just said, your, your particular policy goals would not fit well with the Department of Education's policy goals right now. You probably want to go work for a nonprofit. 
Um, and then, you know, in terms of OCI, the, the process was the same for me, I think, as it probably was for, for all of them. You know, you, you go through an interviewing process um, and, and there it was also an alumni connection. I, I ended up you know, really the, the place I ultimately went to start my career, which is a firm called Covington and Burling, um, which is based out of DC, though I was in their San Francisco office. It was just a good connection with an alum. And so that is, it's incredibly important that you, you tap your networks, you know, whether it's the network where you're going to law school. So, you know, our Detroit Mercy Network, and we have a particularly strong network here in Michigan, of course. Um, but also, you know, the networks that you're building now as, as OU students, right? Because the people that you're meeting, your professors, your peers, um, other Oakland University graduates, I mean, you really should always feel like, you know, the, those are people who have something in common with you and you should reach out with them to ask questions. And, you know, there's most people, um, most people really want to be helpful. Um, I think it's really hard for some students, you know, because they feel like, oh, I don't want to ask for something, you know, I don't want to bother people. Um, but, you know, most people really like helping out um, younger folks, particularly folks who have that shared background. So um, I would just encourage you all, you know, to, to work on networking now, you know, and, and, and to view it more, I think it's like friendship building. I think that that helps some people, right? Like you might make a friend, um, you know, and have coffee with them occasionally for years, nothing ever happens. And then suddenly it's like, oh, hey, we have this opening. I think you'd be a really good candidate. Do you want to interview for it? Um, but it's not, it's not because like you're using them instrumentally, it's because like now you're friends, um, now you're coffee buddies. So that's, that's networking. Um, and so I think once you sort of view it that way, it's like friendship network, um, it, it becomes a, easier and more fun. Great, let me ask you one quick question that I know we're drawing to a close ask, Emily, Christian and Brianna, um, any particular classes, um, you, the road to law school. I know, Christian, you shared you want the science route and realize that's not what you were interested. Any particular classes that jumped out at you um, that were very helpful? Um, I remember a faculty member once told me that she took a poetry class and she felt poetry really, a poetry class was really helpful because in poetry, every word means something. And in law, every word means something. You can't skip and jump. Um, another student said to me, statistics and and economics classes, because you're reading story problems and pulling out variables. And that's what law is, reading a big, long story problem and going from there. So uh, I'll open it up to Christian, Emily, or Brianna. Can you share particular classes or the, ro the road to, to law school? Yeah, for sure. Um, there were two in my mind that stood out. Um, first, it was called Reasoning Skills. It's this very introductory ethics and um, kind of philosophy class that helped you just kind of understand why you make choices and how to logically reason through something. That sparked an interest, but I think the biggest thing was uh, my undergraduate thesis. Um, basically, I just had to do research, had to conduct an experiment, but I had to write that whole thing up as a scientific article. So the whole process of uh, researching other articles, reading them, understanding it, then writing my own thing. If you can gain any experience in that, um, I think that will tell you uh, what you like. And if you like that, I think law, uh, going to law school will be perfect for you because that's what completely sparked my interest. Um, for me, I uh, I would have to say that um, I took business law with Professor Professor Sugamelli at Oakland University, and that was really helpful. He taught it just like a law school class. He cold called. He made us recite rule statements in our answers on the exams. So if you guys have the opportunity to take business law with Sugamelli, I would definitely recommend that. That's good. Hi, Brianna. What do you think? Any classes that jump out at you? Um, I was trying to think about what classes I took in undergrad. There were some um, theory classes that I had to take for my major, but I don't, I mean, that helps me with my reading because we did have to read a lot and we did have to write a final paper. But I think for me, what really made the law or law school stand out to me was the experience that I had in undergrad. I was on the mock trial team at my school and I had an internship with a, a judge in Kalamazoo. And that experience is what made me think, oh, like, I really like this. I want to go to law school. So unfortunately, I, I'm just drawing a blank. I can't think of any classes. But um, 
if you guys have the opportunity to get any type of legal experience, that would probably be beneficial um, and would could reaffirm that law school is what you want to do. Okay, great, great. Carol Ann, do you have any questions that any questions for our students before they head out? I do. I get a lot of uh, questions. I'm with Career Services here at Oakland. So <clears throat> I get a lot of questions from our students. Um, what advice, if you were to give them one piece of advice of besides Brianna, what you just said about getting experience, what else would you suggest to them that they do now to set them up to be successful in law school? Um, I, I think the best thing I can say is uh, try to become disciplined. Um, set goals for yourself. Um, so when it comes to school, set your reading goals and just work on becoming disciplined, sticking to that goal. Um, that's just kind of like a broad thing. Uh, other than that, fall in love with reading. Um, really like to read and really critically read. So understand what you're reading and um, really understand why the, uh, the author is writing what they are, because then you can kind of, that's basically what law school is. So if you can just stick to your, you know, stick to your guns, set goals, achieve them as best as you can, and then fall in love with reading, I think you're going to make a great law student, a good lawyer. Christian, let me ask you, so you actually have a very specific schedule that you follow for your classes, for your reading and homework. Can you just kind of give me, just give us a little tidbit of that? Yeah, so this is my this is my advice to every like one L and every TA. This like I do this as my first lesson, but what I figured out in like two weeks into my one L year was I need to do my work on the weekends. I like to have my time during the week. So my schedule is I wake up, you know, on a Saturday, I will work from at least 9:30-ish, let's say, to be uh, to be friendly, 9:30 till like three, four o'clock. I try to do it again on a Sunday. Um, I'll still go out on my you know Friday, Saturday nights, but then that leaves me basically all my reading hardcore work is done for the week. And then I can just, you know, enjoy my uh, my nights and evenings after class. I can work out and do what I want. But if I don't hit those targets, then my week is ruined and I'm stressed. and I'm going, you know, waking up school, homework, school, homework, sleep. It's just it's not what you want to do. So set a schedule, stick to it. Find out how long it takes you to read something. I know it takes me an hour to read 10 pages and make my notes. That's like that's how it is. Um, but now that I know that I see 40 pages, I'm like, okay, four hours is ahead of me. And I, once I stick to that goal, I'm, I've been pretty good. I haven't missed reading yet. So knock on wood. How about you, Emily? So I would say that if you are, um, if you're, if you haven't taken your LSAT yet, I would definitely take the LSAT early. That would be my advice. If you're pre-LSAT, pre-admitted to law school, um, if you're not, uh, or if you have, and you're already admitted, then I would try to, um, focus on outlining, just getting used to extracting the key material from what you're studying and putting it down into your notes so that you can reference it later and that it's easier for you to memorize. Brian, anything else? I think they both took my answer. So the only <laughs> thing I would say, um, I guess, is uh, I think Christian just said this though, just getting organized, getting a schedule, using a planner if you don't already, that helps me stay organized and on top of everything. Um, I, I guess like maybe get used to writing or um, learn to enjoy writing because that's a skill that I'm still learning, but it's a skill you'll need for law school. And oh, I guess um, when it comes to actually like applying to law school, have people look over your application, like your uh, personal statement. I, that's something I had many, many drafts on because I thought it was good the first time, but I had someone else read it and they were like, no, you should change this <laughs> and that. So I would say maybe start that early so you can give yourself time to have someone else look at it and then do multiple drafts because you want to make sure you're presenting your best self. Um, but yeah, that's what I would say. Great, thank you, thank you. Well, our time is up. I'm trying to keep it on a, pretty much a schedule. So uh, thank you, Christian, Emily, and Brianna. Um, what I'm gonna do to the folks that are here, um, I will have your email addresses and Professor Archards and I will share those. I see they shared some of them in the chat, but I will share them again so you can reach out to them and ask additional questions um, in the future. Um, the next part of our program, thank you, you guys, you can head out or go to class or you're welcome to stick around. Um, the next portion is talking about the admissions process. And um, one of the things that uh, uh, we always have questions about is how do I get into law school? What do I have to do? 
Um, Professor Archer, if she's going to stick around, is great because Professor Archer has been on the admissions committee, so she's reviewed applications, made admissions decisions, and things like that, which is important. But one of the things that we look at um, for students is it doesn't matter what your major is. You can major in anything, um, as you can see by the, the students, the different majors that they had are current students. Um, but whatever you decide to major in, make sure you do it well. So choose a major that you're going to do well and be successful at. Don't choose a major because somebody told you you need to major in this, political science or history. Choose a major that you love. Um, in law combined, you can hear from the students a variety of different skills. So you have skills in writing. You have to be able to write efficiently. You have to be able to read and understand lots of reading. You have to be able to speak in front of groups. So you combine a variety of different types of schools and, and anal analytical type of things also. So your application to major, you can major in anything. So your, your major doesn't matter. And I know we talked to one student who was a freshman and I think John is a, a sophomore. Choose a major that you love and do well, but choose then pick up some classes that can kind of highlight some other things I, I think would be helpful. Um, taking additional types of you know, history classes that require you to memorize classes, additional writing classes, um, things on that analytical uh, classes that make you think, uh, multi-level classes, statistics, as and I said in economics. Um, any classes that you suggest, Professor Archer, that you've seen or? I, I think what the students were telling them is right, which is that critical reasoning and mm -hmm. writing are both really important skills to have um, as a law student. And so, you know, any course that really requires dense analytical reading, whether that's, you know, a philosophy, political philosophy, economics, or, or history, I think is great. Um, you know, I think things that involve rules and applying rules and sort of understanding rule structures are really helpful. So I had an undergraduate minor in linguistics, and I actually think that that minor in linguistics probably helped me more than my major in psychology did in, in terms of the sort of legal analysis piece. Now, the psychology major helps with the negotiation kind of stuff that I do as well, but, you know, a lot of why I think people find law school difficult at first is because it's so rule-based um, and so somewhat counterintuitively people who have engineering degrees computer science you know programming experience often find law school easier than they expected now they have to do the writing piece but the actual analysis piece is a little easier so I think your suggestions were great I mean do something that might feel a little counterintuitive like a stats class or you know like a logic class or a philosophy class just to get used to that sort of analysis. Great so the application process so as we said you can major in anything so um, the application process is relatively easy you fill out an application online um, you take the LSAT and you don't want to take the LSAT um, cold turkey. You want to make sure that you've studied for it. It's a different type of test. So many of you probably took the ACT or the SAT. You know, the ACT, the more math and science and English that you have, usually the student does better because it tests you on whatever you, those classes. So the more math you've had, analytical geometry, calculus, they'll test you on that. You usually do better on the test. The LSAT has nothing to do with what you've learned. You have to learn to train your brain to think a certain way. And the LSAT is that kind of test. And it's reading a story problem and pulling out the variables and picking the best answer. Um, one of my students said to me, it's like taking an AP class, um, kind of that kind of thought process. There, there could be more than one answer that is correct, um, but you must choose the best answer. And uh, that's the way to look at the LSAT. So um, LSAT, LSAC has a service called Khan Academy, which is free for students. There's outside services. Um, you can do um, whatever is easiest, however you learn best. If you learn by books, sorry. If you learn by books, any. Yeah, I, I think the important <laughs> thing is that if you're, if you're studying for the LSAT, one of the things that needs to be included in your studying is taking tests under timed conditions. Mm -hmm. um, because that I think is the piece that students sometimes skip. Um, and if you're not used to taking it under time conditions, then when you're taking it on test day, um, it's easy for your mind to blank. And so I, I 
I'm a huge believer, regardless of what you're doing, whether it's free, whether it's paid, that you sit there with a timer and you actually force yourself to use a timer. Yes. So Maybe think- not on test day itself, because somebody will be doing the timer for you then, but to keep yourself honest when you're studying. Yes, the LSAT is important, so don't take it lightly. So we're going to look at your LSAT scores. We're going to look at your grades, the type of classes that you took in undergrad. Um, we have a lot of statistical information that we have about yourself um, and if, being a student at Oakland University. Um, we do require two letters of recommendation, um, a, a resume and a personal statement. And I always tell the story with the with the two letters of recommendation many years ago, and I don't know if Aaron, you were on the committee at that time. In fact, a student sent, uh, somebody sent in a letter of recommendation for a student and it was, he said, you know, Bob was not my best student in the class, but he was the hardest working. You know, Bob set up study groups, Bob came to me for support. Yeah, Bob got to be in the class, but I think he would be a great asset to your law school. Well, that's the kind of person that we want in law school that knows how to work. We've had many a student who have been very successful um, on the LSAT and a good student in undergrad, but never really learned how to study. It, they just, it came natural. In law, it's the very few people know how to do that. That's a little more challenging. So you want to choose two letters of recommendation of um, staff people, professors who can talk about you not only as, um, as one of their students, but something a little bit about yourself because we have your grades, we have your test scores. So share something about, you know, things that you've done in class and that's important. Um, your resume, your resume is a great opportunity to talk about all the things that you did. Christian shared that some of the, that he had to kind of boost up his resume a little bit more because that's an opportunity for, uh, this is a time when you can kind of fill that out, that, uh, that resume with a variety of different interests and things like that, because that becomes a talking point to people. So that's important. Many of our students come with prior knowledge. Emily, who was with us earlier, she had a prior life before starting law school. Christian had done a few other things before law, starting law school. Um, Professor Archer, we have engineers, we have teachers, we once had a physician. Um, we have this whole menagerie of type of people. Then we have traditional students who come right out of college. Um, going into law school. So we're looking at the LSAT, we're looking at your letters of recommendation, we're looking at your two letters, uh, uh, to your, your two letters of recommendation, your resume. Last thing is really to think about is your personal statement. And Brianna touched upon that. Um, the, the personal statement, I, I think of it as um, a writing sample um, to see how you take an idea and formulate it into two pages. Um, it can be on anything, anything, anything you want, anything you feel the most comfortable with. Um, I always say it's a, it's a personal statement, but don't make it too personal. This is not the time that you want to share and say, I've never told anybody this before. We don't want to be that first person. So what happens is your whole file comes to the admissions office and admissions is, decision is made. Um, oh, well, employer recommendations, yes, but one has to be from a faculty member. But it comes to the admissions office and an admissions decision is made. An admissions decision is made whether you're admitted, whether you're put on a wait list, whether you qualify for academic scholarships. So something different about Detroit Mercy Law is everything is read. We don't just look at the grades and your test scores. We're looking at that whole picture. So when students talk about, you know, what do I need to get in and what's the most important? Well, you need everything to get in because we're going to be looking at everything and on how we're going to put together a, a, a class of a group of students that are diverse in a variety of different ways and can, can you know, be successful. So. Um, a lot of time is spent in reviewing your application, so that, that's important. I don't know, Erin, do you want to share anything else? I, I think what we're really looking for is a student who I think, as was said earlier, is willing to put in the work for law school. Um, yeah, I don't want to sugarcoat it. Law school's hard work, um, and being a lawyer is hard work. I think it's really rewarding work, uh, but... It is, it is tough and it's going to challenge your mind in, in ways that you might not have had a lot of experience with in undergrad. And so, you know, as, as Barbara was saying, it's really important to us to feel from you in your application, I'm ready to do this, I'm ready to rise to the occasion. Um, and so, you know, I, I saw some comments about, well, you know, do I have to major in X or Y? They, most Many schools don't even have a pre-law option, right? So you major in whatever you find intellectually engaging, you know, what, what really drives you. And then you show us on the admissions committee, like, yes, I was a theater major, 
Um, you know, and here's something that I did with my theater degree, and that's why it's driving me to go to law school, you know, because I love intellectual property. And, you know, I did this project about copyright and like artist rights, and now I'm driven uh, to get a law degree so I can work with these groups and work in the theater community, right? So you draw the connections um, for us. That's, that's what you need to do. Um, and, and it could be anything. I mean, you could major in anything and make that connection to how that has pushed you towards your law degree. Mm -hmm. I always tell the story, and, and I'm, some of you, I don't know if you've heard it before, is I was coming down in the elevator many years ago with a student, and she was a teacher by day, and she was taking night classes, and she had this funny look on her face, and her name was Karen. And um, I said, Karen, what is going on? And she said, I know exactly what I want to do. And I said, what? And she said, I want to work in family court. I want to work with families. And I'm like, wow, that's tough. And she said, yeah, it's like Jerry Springer, but they don't throw the chairs. And that was that light bulb moment. I saw this light bulb. And I always say this to students. I see a lot of light bulbs when people find their passion um, that, that, that shows exactly what they want to do based on their experience and the experience that they've had in law school, their experience that they've had their work experience while being in law school, um, and that kind of support services that are available. So um, I think that's one of the strengths um, that, that students find is they, they find their passion. That's not always the case. I do want to share with you a little bit about the three plus three program um, that we started that was started a few years ago, which is a great program. Emily um, Elmer was a, a, was a member of that. Um, and that's for the integrated studies program where students will go to school for three years at Oakland University. You have to maintain a certain grade point average LSAT scores and apply to the law school. I have to pull up my little cheat sheet. Um, you have to have at least a 3.5 grade point average and a 154 on your LSAT. Oh, I see. Carolyn put the information down so you can get more information. Um, your application should be, should be received by February 1st. It is flexible depending on what's going on. Um, and those students, your last year of undergraduate will be your first year of law school. Um, and that's what Emily did. So when she graduates, when Emily graduates with her law degree, she'll also have her um, Oakland degree at that time also. Um, and that's a great program to get into if you're interested, if you're early in your career. Um, and we can talk in more detail about that on one-on-one. -on -one. Um, uh, and once again, any other major is open and I guess I'll open it up to questions now if any folks have any questions for us. Or Carol Ann or Aaron, you want to add anything? I guess I'll just add um, LSAT is money, right? So the higher you can get your LSATs, the more likely you are to get scholarship offers from us and other institutions. So um, for those of you who like external incentives uh, to have that light at the end of the tunnel, I think that's a good way to think about the LSAT, right? Is that, you know, you're not just trying to get over a bar to get in to law school, you're trying to raise the bar because raising that bar um, increases your potential for scholarship um, money. So I, I encourage you all to really, as, as Barbara says, take, take it seriously because it, it will give you options. Right. It'll give you some flexibility. All right, Mariana, do you have a question? Um, yes, um, thank you. Um, I was just wondering um, about the resume. Um, I'm very aware that um, a regular resume is different than like a law school resume. Um, but if you've had like multiple jobs, I guess, like which jobs are best to highlight? Especially if like I've had an internship like at a law firm, but that's like one job and I'm going to put on more. So which jobs would be best to highlight on that law school resume? Um, I, I think it. I think you want to put down just a handful of jobs. I mean, like I had when I started out and, and when I was younger, I was a cleaning lady. I cleaned uh, in a resort and that was my job when I was 15 years old, every Saturday morning from seven to three, I cleaned chalets, what they were. I don't think I would put that down on my resume, um, though it, I, am a, I am an awesome cleaner as a result. I'm very detailed as a result of that. But you know, I think you can put a handful of things down. Um, it's nice that you're lucky that you've had that experience, but also it gives a talking point for people to see. When I was in college and undergrad, um, I went to college um, and I went to Ireland for a semester. So I always put that on my resume because that's kind of a talking point where people said, oh, that's interesting. 
and things like that. So it's important to put your jobs down. You can share your experiences. Um, your resume for law and when you're in law school will be completely different. And the, you know, the career services will help you through that process to make sure that you're very succinct. But for right now, I mean, you can share what you've been doing, but like I said, I don't think, I don't, I don't think I ever put down, I was a cleaning lady. So, and, and I, again, I think you would want to think about the narrative that you're trying to tell us as a law school, right? So obviously if, if you have anything sort of professional, legal, I would include that. Mm -hmm. um, but if, you know, you were the manager of a restaurant or a store um, and one of the things you're going to talk about is like something that experience taught you, put it in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi, is that Paul? Yes, how are you? Good, Paul, are you related to the Tomas we have here? Yeah, Tina Toma. Yeah, Tina and, and Mike, yeah, Michael. Yeah, yeah, Tina's my sister. Oh. Oh, Tina's <laughs> my sister, yeah. <laughs> okay, we caught you, we caught you. You're yeah. a ringer, you're a ringer. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't gonna mention it, but since you brought I it up, I, yeah. I remember the name, but I think your cousin's here too, Michael, who went to I don't, Loyola? I, uh, no, I think, um, I don't have a cousin named Michael, but Tina is my sibling. Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's somebody else. There's a another, small yeah, world, Detroit. Detroit. Small world. What's your question? Yeah. Okay. So here, just quick, uh, brief background about myself. So I go to Oakland University right now. I am a master's of computer science student. Um, my undergrad was in bioengineering. Um, I work for the Department of Defense right now, um, General Dynamics. And one of the big things I've been studying during my master's is blockchain technologies. So like crypto, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and not just the financial aspects of it, but more of like the technological um, um, attributes with it. And uh, one of the things I'm interested in is br bridging the gap between like law and like blockchain. Because right now um, in regards to government, there's not many regulations because um, in my opinion, you know, um, it's a very niche subject, but I feel that it's going to be very prevalent in the future in regards to like uh, finance. So my question is, does Detroit Mercy um, have any type of like coursework or anything in regards to like crypto or like blockchain or just like finance um, in general? We, we do sometimes offer corporate finance. Um, we also do securities regulation. Um, and, securities. you know, my guess is that if, if the feds ever get serious about regulating uh, crypto, it's probably going to be through the SEC, but, or, you know, but maybe not. Um, so I, to my knowledge, we do not have any professors currently teaching a blockchain and the law class at Detroit Mercy. Uh, we do have some adjuncts teaching in other sort of related areas in law and technology. We also recently um, hired onto the 10 year track an intellectual property a new intellectual property professor. I don't know if crypto is, is one of her sort of areas of specialty. I think you're right that this is gonna be a bigger issue. And I think it's about more than just finance, right? Because mm -hmm. um, people are doing all kinds of things on the blockchain that, yeah. um, you know, including adjudicatory systems, right, that are being set up on the blockchain. Uh, so I think it's going to continue to be something that people are talking about. And I think it's going to be sort of an open question how much we can really yeah. regulate it. Um, yeah. So, so I think, um, you know, I think you're in sort of the right space, right, to be looking at, um, you know, thinking about taking administrative law, all right, which is largely about sort of how how regulations happen. Mm -hmm. um, I know a number of people, so I supervised a student mm -hmm. note um, for a student that was talking about contracts and and blockchain, um, you know, and about creating smart contracts. Smart contracts, blockchain. yeah. On the yeah, blockchain. so yeah. Um, so we have a number of students who are really interested in this area. Uh, so I never yeah, say never about us offering a class, but as far as I know, we don't offer a crypto class right now. Yeah, actually, I'm programming a smart contract right now. So then it's really cool because like, I, I, I have the technical aspects, but I just want more of the, the, the lawyer aspect, the law aspect of it. Okay. And you aren't kidding when you say it's highly technical. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. So uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you guys. Um, have a, have a great day. Thanks, Paul.
Any other questions? I think we're all set. Um, I, what I'm going to do is I will get um, obviously your email addresses. I will include Professor Archer and the three students' email addresses as I shared um, with you. To um, uh, you, you're welcome to reach out to them. I'll also invite you to campus. We do give campus tours. You need to sign up through Calendarly, and I will include that link in my note. You're more than welcome to join us. Um, my tour day is Tuesday, so if you can make it on a Tuesday, that would be great. If not, there's other days that are available. Um, and we'll leave it at that. So, Caroline, anything else you'd like to share? I want to thank you all for taking the time to attend. We appreciate it uh, very much. Hopefully, we were able to get your questions answered for you. But uh, like Barbara said, you will be receiving an email from her. So if there's other questions, you can add those. Strongly encourage you to use the OU resources. I put many of them in the chat. And certainly one of those resources is our very own career service office. We can help you with your resume and we can certainly help you prepare um, you know, for whatever direction your future takes you. So thank you guys very much for attending today. And thank, thank you, you and Professor Archard for attending. Thank you, Professor Archard. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.